What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another awesome episode of Red Tech Live. This is a special National Camera Day. Hell yeah. Right? That's awesome. We're doing a great talk today. We're going to talk about building up your V Raptor. And I got Johnny in here with me. Escape We're... the UK. <laughs> right? Better weather. Definitely. <laughs> and we got James as well. How you doing, guys? All right. So this is one I'm really excited about. As you can see, we've got this beautiful full cinema package right here. We actually just used this yesterday on a test shoot, and it's all the way kitted up for all the things that you want to do on a major set. We've got everything from wireless follow focus, our Preston's on here. We've got an awesome sun hood that we got going on. Pretty excited about that. But really, it's all about this production pack. But this is the big guy. I think we should start right at the, the smaller one, the smaller production packs. So I think James has, has some, some good insight on that. Yep. So what we're actually looking at here is a, my modified, uh, this is basically the starter pack, but I've got some elements of the production pack light. And really, I designed this, or I really have my, my camera built in such a way that with two screws, this can easily transition into another build or anything else. So we're going to actually go through all of the items that come and uh, in this production pack light. You can see we have our top handle here with our run stop right there. You can also see that I've got my full size XLR adapter here giving you two channels with phantom power. I can also stop the recording and show you how we have our nice integrated expander blade right here on the bottom for both Genlock, timecode, control, run stop. And if we tip this up on the bottom, you can also see the, uh, the bottom plate as well as our anti-tip plate, which is really nice when I set this down. I don't have to worry about the camera falling off of the desk here. And uh, also want to show that it's just really nice that you can go right into our quick release here. Notice that I have a 15 millimeter rail that I can easily transition right here to my uh, GDU, uh, my GDU Atlas handle and you can have your uh, motor or nucleus going right here in the front of the camera. And the other nice thing too with this quick release is this is a airy on the bottom and you can see right there we have our plate that I can easily release. Notice that you hit the button there on either side to release that plate. And I can very easily transition that to an airy style plate, you can see that. And now my camera can very easily transition to a shoulder rig. So really nice to be able to have that with both the um, production pack light and the starter pack. I mean, this is one of the things with how we've designed all the accessories. We've tried to design it to be as flexible as possible. One of the things me and Clay were talking about earlier was that the accessory package gives you the ability to bolt on whatever you want to, be able to build that package up. And the starter pack with the handle, the XLR, the, the expander blade we'll touch on a little bit later, it kind of lays that groundwork for you to be able to build out and accessorize it how you want because everyone rigs their camera out differently. We're going to look at three of our rigs today using fundamentally all the same accessories, but they're all going to be rigged out very differently. James shoots in a very different way to me and Clay. I shoot very differently. And then Clay, you know, the one that is typically doing the higher budget shoots of all of us kind of <laughs> has this camera rigged out like this. And that's kind of really where these kind of come into their own. So. I think we'll kind of move on to this production pack accessory. I, I guess just work from top to bottom. I and mean, we were shooting with yeah. this yesterday. We had everyone, you know, a, a typical crew, AC, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So you know, you really can rig this camera up as big or as small as you want. Yeah, and it's it's set up right now in a way that I see on set all the time. And and we're really in a place where we've got all the stuff ready to go. Like so. As we're stop starting at the top here, the handle gives us amazing mounting points. You can see just how many different places we're actually tying in and utilizing that space. You, if we tip up here, we can really see, sorry, wrong way. But yeah, as, as you see here, we're getting all of this juice out of these mounting points. We've got our little 15 mil rod here. We had a Preston Light Ranger up there earlier. It's just, a, it was a little big for the setup today. I felt like it was blocking me and Johnny. We want to be a part of the stream too, guys. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're also utilizing this, uh, the support right here, makes it so that this is all tied together really, really well. And that all leads in to our top plate and our RMI. Um, so Johnny, why don't you talk to us? we're having some oh. audio. It's just, J James, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys just fine. I, I maxed you all the way up and brought myself down a little bit. 
Okay, let's just, okay. Let's just check. Yeah, sorry guys. Yeah, yeah we, sorry we everyone. We're trying to fix the sound on the side. We realized <laughs> it was us that was not coming through. So we'll just wait for you guys to confirm you can hear us. Um, I, I, I got you. I can hear you. Let's just check that the, uh, that the stream can hear us quickly. Yep. Yep. Sounds good Sorry now. Sorry about that, guys. I'll just I'll fill us in with some space here, well, just in case. Nothing too pertinent, right? Just fun stuff. <laughs> so it's yes. always the way where you test it beforehand, everything yeah. works, and then you start going live, and then everything falls apart. So That's right. I'm still quite quiet. Let's see if we can yeah. change that test. Let's bolt that one up. Oh. All right. There we go. How are we doing with sound now, everybody? We do apologize for that. Like Johnny said, we did some testing, but you know, you can test and test and test, and still stuff like this happens, right? <laughs> okay, I think hopefully we've got that now. Sorry. Okay. Awesome. Back to the rig. So I right. guess maybe we didn't hear any of the start of that. So should we start yeah. at the top of the rig again? Yeah, let's start at the top of the rig again. What we're looking at really, what I'm super excited about, is just all the amazing mounting points on the handle. We've got our 15 mil rod extension up here that gives us an easy way to mount things. You can put the monitor up here, but early we, earlier we actually had a Preston Light Ranger up there as well. We took it off because we felt like it was blocking us. We wanted our screen down. It was actually a really nice compact way to mount that on because usually yeah. with a Light Ranger, you, uh, you would have like a Titan arm or something on here. Yeah. But actually being able to have it on like a really compact point was quite nice. Obviously some people will kind of mount the Light Ranger a bit further forward. But again, just having a nice 15 mil rod that you can bolt in with some anti-twist points is just really nice for e e even a microphone. If you wanted to have a microphone up here on, on a little 15 mil rod or whatever you need, it's just nice to have that flexibility. And, and the parts we're talking about with this top handle are part of the extension pack. So yep. you have the base handle, which is this little five inch piece along here. And then as Clay will discuss in a moment, we've then got the wraparound piece a front one inch piece uh, that then allows you to kind of configure it out. How, uh, there we go, yep, that's the perfect. Exactly, so now, now you can really see the full breadth of that handle. And as we see it extending down the back here, we get to operate off of there, but it also gives us all these great mounts to play with. The thing that you said that I really keyed into and enjoyed is the anti-twist. So like that's something with the handle as well, having multiple tie-in points, it's very, very secure. It feels easy to use and it gives us, like I said, all these different mounting points to get the accessories that everybody's using on set and in a way that's really easily accessible for ACs and camera operators. I mean, especially you know, with the operating, people like to hold on to the batteries and these kind yes. of things, or if, if you've got an easy rig, or depending on if you've got a really heavy setup here, like you have with, with this Primester lens, take some of these three inch or five inch pieces and put them coming off the front because th th this front part of the handle is still completely modular. So you can tack these pieces onto the front if you've got a really heavy setup and you really want to counterbalance that a bit nicer. So again, just having a modular handle is really, really nice and it yeah. ties it and feels nice. Having a nice wood inlay there a I bit agree. nicer than getting like a warm or hot handle if you're on a hot day, especially yeah. yesterday we're shooting at exactly. 100 degrees. We're out outside in 100 degrees. It's not getting sweaty. It's not getting weird. <laughs> Like, I really think that it's, it's a really easy handle to use and affords you a lot of ease of use as well as just functionality. But below that, the, the other things that we start to get into are things like the plate and the battery and the RMI. So Johnny, why don't you kind of walk us through a little bit how, how the plate attaches to the camera. Awesome, yeah. So uh, a top plate is, is always an important part to a camera. It gives you mounting points. but with V-Raptor, we wanted to do something a little bit different and give you some more functionality with the top plate. So hopefully if I can position this just correctly oh, and we get our... Oh, there shoot. There we go. There we are. There we go. So hopefully you can see there, we've actually got these pogo pins on the... If I can get my orientation correct. <laughs> right. There we go. So there's some pogo pins on the very top here. And this will take power from the battery adapter and you've got two of these two pin limos on the top here. So that's how we're powering our Teradek, that's how we're powering our Preston. Uh, we've then got DTAP on the battery, there's a DTAP on the battery adapter. So you've got loads of power inputs, outputs, because you know, on the camera natively, because it's so small, we haven't got any natively built in. So having it in this top plate was a really nice way to make it really tight uh, and kind of easy to access. There's also a little LED light here. So if you're working in a really dark situation, uh, you can illuminate the side of the camera. So 
you bolt the battery plate. If I get the battery plate, you can see that this has a couple of little pogo pins on the back as well. There's some tie down points here as well. So it's a really rigid connection. You bolt it onto the back of the camera, screw it in, and then you've got a really solid system. Because one of the things we found is that a lot of battery adapters, a lot of V-Lock adapters, there's sometimes a bit of wiggle and we didn't want any of that in this system. We wanted yep. it to feel like it's part of the camera. And that's really what this gives you. So then you're passing the power through and you'll see actually on this setup, you know, we, uh, we wanted a bit of hot swap. So we've got a, uh, a little shark fin, maybe on the other side oh, actually. Yep. We've got a little shark fin here and then a couple of just simple Red Volt Micro Vs that you can just hot swap in there. Uh, this is one of the Bebop adapters uh, just to give you, again, to build up to that production kind of setup that people want. They want to be able to uh, take batteries off, keep all their accessories live and powered while they're working with the camera. Yeah, yeah. all those little attentions to detail are, or attention to details are things that like really set this rig apart, in my opinion. The little LEDs, the fact that things tie together to be really, really secure, it does make it feel like this camera becomes a slightly different camera with this rig on it, right? It, it becomes a really built to use on set setup. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's one of the things that yesterday we had a camera set up like this, and then later on we're going to show you the, uh, the gimbal yeah. setup that Clay was working with. So literally you can have the smallest possible package, but then the fullest cine package all from one body as well. And you know, yeah. it's all just you know, relatively easy screws to undo. You know, we, we were taking handles off and things all day and configuring it in different ways. So yeah. it really is very simple to do that. And it was oh, about yeah. this small when you started, right? I yes, think that's exactly. The thing. When I when I walk around with that production pack built up like you have it there, the common question I get asked is, "Oh, is that the Excel?" And no, it's just the stuff that you're looking for in the Excel. And 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 really, I think that's the flexibility: one camera to build it up, one camera to make it smaller. And really, what we're seeing here is the best of both. Exactly. Totally agree. Then kind of so uh, moving down, we've uh, then got some, some side ribs. So you can kind of see these side ribs hopefully here on the front. They have actually screw into the top plate and onto the camera arca plate. Uh, if we spin that around this there way. Like that. There we go. So you can kind of see here, we have one rib here. We've got a uh, standard uh, Ari style rosette, a load of anti-twist points on there. And you can see it just bolts in down here into the camera plate. So you've got a really rigid connection on there onto the side of the camera and again i mean from a more design perspective you know having it flow nicely into the body you know quite a lot of accessories are just you know squares of metal we wanted to try and you know make it feel like it's part of the camera system and blend really nicely into that system and um, i can see the production plates right there as well johnny right you can see that right there giving you extra rigid oh no yeah exactly so uh, so uh, um, included in the production pack you uh, get these production plates and these basically give you a little bit of underside protection so yesterday we were throwing this thing in and out of cars and all this yeah. kind of stuff and just having a bit of underside protection because you know quite a lot of cameras we've seen you know they get beat up you know the underside of the camera really gets chucked around yeah. a lot. so having a little bit of protection there can be quite nice of course and like johnny was saying it's it's 100 degrees outside we're in the la river you're it's, you've got the camera you need to run to get something else you're gonna set it on the ground it's a thing that happens all the time right like we're not we would love to all be doing best practices all the time and have cushy camera carts with us but sometimes when you're running around on the fly even in larger productions, you need to make things happen quickly. And so things like setting the camera on the ground, they happen. And so when you put little bits of extra kit in there to help protect, protect the longevity of your equipment and really keep things going strong, I feel like it's really beneficial to the overall flow on set. And speaking of extra bits of kit, when you're putting that together, you might notice there's an additional production plate. There's one for each side and it, and it fills that same space as the expander blade. So if you yeah. wonder why you have an extra piece from your production pack, there are times when you might not need the expander blade and that's what that additional plate is. So just one yeah. point. And, and that's exactly what we have installed on this setup because with a, with, with a wireless follow focus system, you want to trigger the thing. You, you want to have yeah. time code, maybe even gen lock if you're doing virtual production. So the blade nicely tucks down here. You know, it's, it's uh, not a big block that you have to mount somewhere, you know, or m maybe with some of the uh, Mutiny IO accessories, you want to have a really small little module that mounts up here or something. Again, just giving you a different option down here to mount and trigger uh, the, uh, the RS through here. So you've got, just got the, the Preston RS cable in here, and then you've got a time code control. So if you wanted to have a RCP2 accessory, which yeah. we'll talk about a little bit later on with Ignite Digi, there's some yeah. cool stuff coming there. Just gives you that ability to break out that EXT port on the back of the camera. 
super, super. So what cool. else have we got here? And, and, and I think that another thing to kind of point out here is that although the uh, quick release platform pack has 50 mil LWS as standard, if you want to go to uh, 50 mil studio or 90 mil studio, I think James will, uh, will go to a shot of you just to show this off. On the very bottom, there's a QR quick release plate, and that basically gives you the correct offset for you to mount on these 15 mil studio or 90 mil studio plates very, very easily. Uh, so James is just going to get that up now. Um, so you can uh, see right here that this is the it, right? Johnny, is that what the, uh, the uh, QR plate that I think we showed last time, James? It's that little square. Yeah, th yeah, that piece there. So that basically gives you your offset to be able to put on a BP9, a BP8, or just a standard 19 mil studio plate that uses that ARRI standard. So very, very nice that you can do that. You bolt it on the bottom, and that's what we've got here um, with, with, with this Primester lens. We've got a, a 50 mil studio plate. We've then got our 50 mil uh, rods, and then a, a lens support for that as well. So again just giving you that flexibility to configure the rig because 90 mil, 50 mil, 50 yeah. mil LWS, everyone rigs their camera very differently depending on yes. what they're doing. Yeah, that it's, was one. That's one I've run into. Oh, sorry, go ahead, James. I was just going to say, I leave, I leave this one on my sticks and then it, it, the, the production pack comes with a longer um, plate as well. And that's the one where you can keep that uh, for balancing, for heavier lenses. But it's really nice that it came with the two plates. Yeah. That's all I had. Awesome. awesome. So I think with the rest of this kit, you know, obviously we've uh, we, uh, we've got some rosette hand grips, but you know, yeah. any standard uh, rosette grips work those kind of things. I mean, James, this would be a great place for you to start showing off some of your your grips that you've got on, on your rig. You know, yeah. GDU grips. There's just normal, you know, Ari style rosette grips that you can bolt on. Yeah, I actually um, just while while you guys were showing off your kit, um, remember how I mentioned I do everything with two screws here. So very quickly, I was able to switch from the production handle, right, which had my full-size XLR adapter, and now I'm going over to my GDU Quantum top handle that went in with two screws there, and notice I have our five pin to 3.5 adapter right here, and so now I have both a GDU handle that's lighter, no start stop, but I have multiple mounting points. I also have a rosette right over here on my other um, outrigger handle, and what that allows me to do is just very easily throw an EVF or an expanded cowboy handle or anything else like that. And I think I mentioned it earlier, you also have these additional M4 screws here, and I can mount one right there or right there, and that would allow me to have another rail system here on the upper architecture of the camera. Really loving that. So I think speaking very nicely of, uh, of mounting things like EVFs, we thought, you know, Clay set up, Clay likes operating with a monitor out in front of him, control sure. the camera, a bit of a sure. bigger view, but people do like using EVFs. So we've got a, a third party EVF here from Astro Design, Zakuto, port keys, all those other kind of EVFs with this uh, GDU side plate that has, uh, has some nice rosette mounting points and some arms that can come off. You can mount those very nicely. Um, I tend to like operating just a bit more lighter, but you know, still being able to have the top plate and battery adapter on the back with some gold mounts. So Clay had V-Lock on the back yep. there, but I've got a nice gold mount on the back here. So you can choose which plate you want to have on the back, and that will still attach to that top plate. So very easily, I can then come up I like to rest the, uh, the uh, battery on my shoulder, because uh, gold mount feels a lot more rigid in that sense, you know, there's no worry of it, of, it, of it flying off, which I know that's why people prefer gold mount. Yep. And just being able to have a setup like this, it is really, you know, again, just having different ways of rigging the camera. Totally. And, and I think a big thing that I wanted to call out with all of this, talking about gold mount, talking about the accessories that we had on that last rig, is that part of the goal or part of the, the thing that you can do that's amazing here is you can use stuff that you already have, right? So you've got gold mount batteries there's the gold mount solution for you, right? If you're running a Preston, okay, now this is the solution to mount that, right? There's, there's so many different things within this setup that allow you to take advantage of the kit that you already have on hand. I think one thing here as well that we're showing is having the monitor in different places as well. So I think this is gonna lead very nicely into Clay's um, uh, gimbal rig. Yeah. The, the monitor comes as standard with a 10 inch uh, uh, USB type C cable. Uh, on, on the rig we had there, we had an 18-inch cable. Uh, we can flip that around again quickly here we just go. to kind of show we'll that off. Do a nice um, little dance here, but you can see my cable coming out of the RMI right there. And that's going down over here. And so that's, that's a nice length, right? I, I still have some room to move this around if I want to. But realistically, oops. All the glasses. Oh, no. 
That was glasses, not part of Thanks, any Jeff. camera. <laughs> All right. How, as Clay whipped that around, nothing wiggled and jiggled, and that was his glasses that fell off. Yeah, yeah, the, exactly. The camera, just to I'm, I'm more likely to break than that camera rig is, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and just having those different length cables, 10 inch when on the camera, 18 inch when still on the camera, but having to get it at the back of the camera, maybe off in front of the operator. And then on this setup, then a 39 inch yeah. cable where you want to have mm. the monitor still have the control but be considerably further away uh, from that setup. Yeah, so unlike that last rig, which is nice and large, but really is benefited by people working with you, right? So an AC, all those different things, it's set up with more crew. This is something that I use as a one-man band all the time. And for me, that's a really easy way to get things done quickly when you don't have a lot of extra hands on set. And so that's why I want this touch functionality on my monitor. I want to be able to control all of my settings. I want to do all that stuff right in front of me really easily. I'm also rocking this Ignite Digi Cage that gives me that RMI availability, right? So the top of the cage is cut out, and then we're, we're mounting into the RMI here, and we're using uh, their bridge, basically a riser, that allows us to get this Ignite Digi plate up on top at a correct height for the RMI to clear. Because also that's, that's the key thing here is in terms of balancing, you want to be able to move it forward and back. Exactly. And if you didn't have this plate, you'd simply be you know, either not being able to use the RMI, RMI or interfering with it. So that's really what allows you to get that forward back. Exactly, uh, and they've, they've created a lot of really amazing gimbal solutions over at Ignite Digi, and something that's not on here right now, but I got a chance to play with it, and I'm super excited to tell you guys about, oh, yeah. is a translation box from RCP1 and RCP2. Meaning that, as it stands right now, my Mobi Pro can't communicate with the camera through RCP, or Red Command Protocol. That is the, that's because the Mobi Pro is on RCP1, and the Raptors on RCP2. But Ignite Digi made a box that'll translate that for me, which does a lot of great things. It allows me to use the Mobi Pro controller and have start, stop, record, and change settings within there. But it also allows me to do something like my latitude here, which I could then run a control cable to that translator and have start, stop, record off of my finger wheel right here, which is something that I got to say since I switched to Vera Raptor, I've been missing it, right? So reaching around to the front of your gimbal rig, touching the camera, I mean, I think we all know anybody who operates gimbal, you don't want to touch the payload. <laughs> you want to do that as little as possible, right? Preserve your motors, and also just to make sure that everything's running clean, it's, it's a lot easier to not be sticking your fingers in there and playing around with the camera once the motors are keeping it still. So something like a finger wheel that's allowing you start, stop, record is hugely beneficial as an operator, and it's something we were kind of missing uh, before uh, on V-Raptor with its integration on older pieces of kit, which kind of ties back into what I was saying before, which is that this is a camera that can work with the equipment that you have on hand as well, which I think is a really huge benefit because I don't want to buy a new gimbal. I'm not waiting for somebody else to make a gimbal that's specifically going to talk to my camera. I'm looking to solve the problems with the equipment that I have and that I'm used to using. Exactly. I mean, uh, some other cool things you've got on here as well. You've, uh, you've got their cage system as well for bolting all of that onto it. And they've got That's a few true. other nice little accessories in there as well, which is super cool. Yep. Um, I but yeah. Totally agree. That's, that's kind of what I was saying. What I was pointing out on this, on this cage is that it does this gimbal work perfectly, but it also gives you some of the things that if you want to pull this straight off and put another rig together right away, it's very easy, efficient, and quick to do. You got rosettes on here, you got tons of mounting area, and it gives you a nice little raise off the bottom of the camera. Sorry, our top down is kind of weird for the gimbal just because it's uh, <laughs> got a bunch of stuff in the yeah, way of the top. The but yeah, you can kind of see now there's Here's our rosette over here. We've just got a bunch of different mounting points on this Ignite Digi Cage that make operating a breeze. <laughs> That's one of the things that, that thanks to so many of our accessory oh. partners that literally any way that you want to work, you, you can get that. I mean, one, one of the accessories that, that I've been using a lot recently has actually been this uh, little uh, GDU kind of shoulder pad. You know, a lot of people love operating, getting as opposed to on the shoulder, in the chest, because these cameras are getting so small that 
that your shoulder hasn't got to be the, the, the place taking the weight. Yeah. So having it, you know, compact, a, a, a little micro battery, a, uh, a, a micro V, whatever you need, jammed into the shoulder with some little stubby grips is super cool. And, and this is one of the things I saw years ago, a lot of people asking about, you know, when Jared yeah. posted that photo, now I'll be able to have something like this. I've loved being able to do this. You know, I do quite a lot of like mountain bike shooting, that kind of stuff. Getting in the, in the undergrowth, having that kind of jammed against me and kind of whipping that camera around is really what I enjoy about this. Yeah, and the, the, the two-handle setup like James is about to show us right here is what leads perfectly into that. And it's, it's a very different shot. A mid-chest shot versus a shoulder shot are going to have different looks. And one of the beauties with RED and pre-record, I know Ivan Egerton's uh, famous for talking about this, I can have a conversation with you right here, an interview, and do that one-man band interview, and you're not looking at, you're looking directly at me, right? You can get some of those really organic or, uh, interviews, and, and you can get them to come maybe drop some of their guard a little bit. Yeah, sort of like street photography classics, right? Like from shooting from the hip, from top-down viewfinders and things like that. I really like when we get to pull bits of vintage shooting styles and things like that into our current rigs. It makes it feel like a really holistic uh, sort of approach to, to this image making. It's, it's fun. It, it allows you to bring in the legacy of where we came from, but utilize the best of modern technology to do it. Well, then, so everyone, again, everyone has a style. Your style of filmmaking, we... We, we don't want the camera to inhibit your ability to use your style. You know, if, if you're, yes. oh, I have to go on the shoulder because of how this camera is rigged. Oh, I, I have to have handheld because of how, how small this camera is. Being able to get it onto a shoulder like, like we showed on, on Clay's first rig or get it into a gimbal or as small as Clay's, as James is sorry. That's just what we wanted to do when designing the accessories. And I think actually, Ooh. James, you know, moving again onto right. how small we can get the camera into some underwater housings. Yeah, talk yeah. about small. Well, and we talked about it. When I, when I held up my rig earlier, I want everything to break down within two screws, two screws, and I'm able to go right into my DSMC3 Salty water, Raptor water housing. The nice thing about water housings are we typically swim out there and I'm taking half of your controls and I'm putting him behind your back and you don't have access to him anymore. That's not the case. This housing gives us full access to the user interface. I can have my multiple uh, presets right on here. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you just a little bit of footage that I was able to get last weekend here. And what you're gonna be seeing here is myself just going right back into that salty water housing. Notice that you can have customized ports to go with your various lenses here. I'm shooting F8 to F11, 180 degree shutter with 8K, 120 frames per second. And notice I can point that directly into the sun or directly into the curl of these passing waves and you're getting all of that highlight detail while still getting all of that incredible shadow detail as well here. And remember, this is 8K. You have four 4Ks within these windows, and I can bring back every part of the shot, including that sun right there, and uh, you get some really cool things. For anyone that does underwater photography, you're gonna notice a couple little vortexes right here as that wave went by. Those are all 35 megapixel stills, and we could go ahead and pull that at any point in time, or even go to something really slow like a 4K 300, which is my new uh, sweet spot that I love to hit in the water. I mean, what, one of the cool things that in talking with you, James, is just that with these underwater housings, you again have different ones for different shooting styles. So you've got your salty for your kind of surf, and then if you're going a little bit deeper, you've got the gates, or if you want to have a different monitor on the back, you've got different backs, different port caps, all of those things, you know, different water housings to, sh to suit the style of shooting you have as opposed to there's only one underwater housing option for you. It's as big as it's got to be and yeah. it's going to be heavy. Whereas if you want a lightweight one, yeah. that was one of the coolest things in speaking with you, James. Yeah, just, just, just what I did right there. The fact that I took the monitor back off because maybe you wanted just a pistol grip housing, I just shortened this housing. So without the camera in it, it was right around uh, four, four kilograms. And I, I, I should have just said the, the Imperial or right around 11 pounds. And with the camera, lens, and battery in there, you're going to be right around 20 pounds. But once again, with these customizable options, you can change the rear architecture of the housing, the front architecture of the housing. And Salty is what, what I would say is a splash housing, good for about 66 feet or 20 meters. I know we talked about it as well with our Gates housings. Those are going to go much deeper, up to 200 feet or 60 meters. And there's some great options from John at Gates as well. Awesome. I think at this point then, we might as well open up if there's any questions. Does yeah. anybody want to ask about any of the rigs we've got? Go yeah. a bit more in detail on them. You know, uh, is, you know, you want to see something a bit, you know, hey, what, uh, what other stuff could I mount on this? How does that bolt together? Uh, feel free to chuck in any questions uh, towards the end here and we can, uh, we can dive into that. There we go. 
boy, I just like the way this guy looks. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, also cool. one thing again, showing off the sunhood. I don't oh, think yeah. we actually spoke about that. So That's again, true. another thing, working yesterday, it was 100 Fahrenheit. The sun was out all day. We were there from what was it, three till eight. So yeah. out there for a long time, having a sunhood, and and this again took a bit of a beating, you know. It did. It's got it's got a little couple little battle wounds from from the day, but that's that's how it works, right? That's how our equipment goes. We take it, we use it. We try to beat it up as little as possible, and that's why all this stuff is built so robust, right? So that it can it can take a little bit of use. That's that's what we got to do. They're tools. They're meant to be used. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So I just wait to mm -hmm. see if there's any questions. Feel free to to send them in. I, I'm I'm seeing a lot of comments here, and they're and they're Barney comments. I love Red, and Red loves you back, and it, it's good to kind of see those come through. But I'm I'm just noticing a couple where maybe customers are are, are perhaps waiting for the Super 35 version of this, and we got Scott Scott Balcom's question coming up here. And for, for that customer that has a very specific Super 35 lenses, and that's all you shoot, there is going to be a, a variant and option that will be Super 35. But for myself and for you guys over there. I love the Raptor VV because it is a multi-format sensor, right? I do yeah. have that ability to shoot Super 35 today, 6K, 5K, close to 200 frames per second, and really still have that Vista Vision option as well. So that's one of the benefits of having the multi-tool or the multi-format capabilities. But once again, there will be an 8K Super 35 variant coming out later this year as well. I've just seen a, a comment come in from Robin. James, if you want to ping that one yep. up. Yep. Um, so yeah, so yeah, th th this is the Red Sunhood. So if uh, if you go on red.com and, and just search uh, Sunhood, that should come up. Um, uh, if we we can actually go ahead and take this off, uh, actually we'll leave it on. Uh, but I don't want to ruin your rig. Yeah, right? We've got to bolt it on at the top. So, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it bolts on to the very bottom of the uh, DSMC3 monitor, and the uh, the DSMC monitor has a couple of mounting points. So we've got it mounted at the top here. But yeah, it basically gives you side and top. Uh, and you know, as we've been using it, there's uh, no you know leaks coming around the side, which I think is very important. You know, if, if you're off-roading, the sun's right in front of you. Uh, you don't want any sort of you know light leak coming from the top. It folds down very nicely as well. So if you want to put it in a backpack, you can take it off, fold it down very very easily, uh, which is really nice. Uh, you know, very bendable as well. So you've got yep. the little uh, rubber bits here that allow it to bend. And again, it's made of a nice hardened plastic, so it will definitely uh, take a beating depending on what you're doing. Oh. Yeah. And I was just trying to show you Johnny's point there. Notice oh, there, there is no, yes. no light leak coming through the top, right? My hand is right in front of the monitor, and you can't see that. And it's the little things like that, that I don't have any little stray light creeping in here. And the other nice benefit, too, is you still have access to all of your user buttons and the additional mounting points. So this hood had a really good think to it, and I, I'm really liking it, especially with the nice big thumb screws there on the bottom. I was actually able to put that on and off real quickly while you guys were just chatting there. So I think James is one from, I think it's Jason. I, I can't yep. quite see, I think it is, or Jason. Yep. I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong. So in terms of the handle accessories, I presume you're talking about the top handle extensions. Um, so while those aren't available on red.com, if you reach out to one of your sales reps, this is something that as a special order item, uh, you'll be able to order. So that will come with the one inch front piece, the 15 mil rod we talked about, You've got a three inch, a right angle piece, and another five inch piece that you can then configure that James is showing off there. So uh, yeah. just uh, feel free to reach out to one of your red sales reps or, or um, reach out to us at solitary series at red.com and we can put you in touch with a rep who can get that sorted out for you. It's just a special order item at the moment. And, and I'm holding three pieces right now, right? There's the curve, this, uh, this is I believe the five inch, and then we have the short three as well as that one. Johnny, you and I, I know we got creative with some small batteries and some slim batteries, and you can really play around with your upper architecture, whether you're doing easy rig, whether you're doing a gimbal, or you like that mid-chest rig. This is a really nice way to make that handle have all of the mounting points and everything you need. I mean, one yeah. of the things, again, just to kind of call out here in terms of the height. So if you're somebody that uses red bricks, those bricks are really, really tall. So you can kind of see uh, the clearance here. We've uh, got a, a, a hot swap adapter on there. So it's definitely something you should consider either using those larger 150 watt hour uh, micro batteries or batteries that, again, just, just you know, aren't really of that older generation that just, yeah. that just protruded very, very highly off the top. Uh, but again, if you don't want that, you, uh, you, uh, you can just stop the handle at the back here yep. and then you can free to use any height battery that you want. Um, yeah. One thing I don't think we discussed is the little support arm here. So, uh, yeah. and if you want to, yeah, that's I I I kind of touched on it earlier, just saying that that multiple mounting points 
for the handle to the body allows for a really rigid and secure handle. It's removable, so if you needed to remove that for a reason, you could, right? You could run just the handle extension off the back. However, in my experience, it's been amazing to have this. It feels super solid. Like when you saw me knock my own glasses off because I like the rig's just that solid, right? It'll knock me over. Like that that's kind of the idea that the stuff like little details like this extra support arm are built in and they make it so that the rig's bulletproof. Like it really is an easy to use piece. And I loved what you were, you guys were saying earlier about okay, so maybe you want a long battery but maybe you're using something like an easy rig and you want to afford yourself some more room to counterbalance on the top, you could take the five inch, throw it off the front. That gives you a lot more play in this uh, front to back direction for balancing with the easy rig attachment. So there's just a, a lot of different things with the handle. And if, in that case, especially, you want is if you're right if you're hanging the thing from the handle you want to have this support. i want three attack three points of contact <laughs> and this comes with the top handle by itself so um basically if you buy the top plate and the top handle it will come with the top handle if you buy just the top handle it will come in in, in the little box there so that that's where you would end up getting that little piece uh, to support the camera there I think we've had a few more coming in, so yep. from Ryan. Uh, so, oh, a uh, power question, I'm guessing, yeah. for, for gimbals. Okay, two questions. Can you use the DSM-T2 power cable to decap? You sure can. Yep, I've been using it on my Mobi Pro. Uh, same thing if you have a Ronin 2 to, to their standard, um, as opposed to a DTAP, that'll work as well. Uh, accessories to get more EXT ports. So there's, so there's nothing that is red approved for EXT to then EXT breakout. What most of the accessories do is it's EXT to breakout to one of the ports. So it's either to time code, gen lock, control, those kind of things. And I'm guessing potentially what you're referring to is you want to have a um, a Cine 7 or Cine 5 that has a EXT cable for control. And what a, lot of, uh, what a lot of the manufacturers do is they have either an EXT cable or a control cable. And then that's the one that then you would plug into one of these breakout boxes, the expander blade, the Mutiny IO, um, some of those kind of ones that have that control port. So it would just be a different cable that you would need. Totally agree. That might also be a place if you're working with that control port cable that you would look for that Ignite Digi Translator box, right? So that's another way you could solve that problem. One more thing, when I see DSMC2 power, and I love using my DSMC2 power with my Raptor, right? My belt clips, the AC power, those all plug directed into the camera. Just know if you are powering the camera just via that Limo, right? You don't have anything connected to this plate. So your two pin power on the plate, your LED light, unless there's a battery on there and you're just going into the Limo, that's not gonna power these additional accessories. So that would be one benefit of having the power on that full size battery plate. So just wanted to make sure that was clear. All right, we got some good questions. I think we've got a few more coming in. Uh, what's the uh, question from Luca? Is that a question there, James? Yeah, let's go ahead there. Okay, RT with onboard Sony battery. So is he, oh, so is this referring uh, this is, to the SDI yeah, protocol? Yeah, the SDI issue. So it's really the important part is that when you are applying power to your accessory, you want to make sure that the SDI is not plugged into the camera. That's that's really that's the baseline of it, right? There's there's other places you can look into our documentation that digs deeper on that stuff. But I feel like that's the baseline that I that I try to have people informed about. So so basically, in this situation where where you've had a battery die and and you want to replace it, the the best practice would be to then you know uh, remove the SDI. Yeah take the battery off, put the new one on, put the SDI back in, because at that point, the, uh, the, uh, the, the battery's died, so you, know, you can yeah. remove that. And it, I mean, I, one easy way to think about it is it's hard to fry something with no power, right? So if the battery's dead, you're probably okay. Take the SDI but, off. <laughs> but what I would say is exa exactly where Johnny was just going, is that always remove the SDI before you swap that battery. That's gonna be the big take takeaway. And that goes back into, you know, if you break down what I said first, you just don't want to apply power to your accessory with the SDI plugged in. That, that's just the baseline of it. I mean, and, and that's just a recommendation. And, and the reason for that is, is, is that when attaching something like a DTAP cable or a battery, there's the potential that power could connect before ground. Now, it, it's not something that will happen every single time. It's something that happens yeah. you know, once in a blue moon when something happens with, with, within that, something gets shorted 
and then it finds ground through the SDI. So that's basically the best way is to remove that ground potential is basically the, the, the way that I think about it. Yeah. And, and, and I put that uh, red article, the SDI support article, in the chat. But notice that if you wanted to check any other manufacturer that has an SDI, they will give that similar recommendation. This is just a best practice with working with SDIs. So I love when someone says, why haven't you fixed it? No, that's just the nature of working with SDIs. There are those best practices. And it, so the Sawyer articulated arm alarm. we have here is the Bright Tangerine Titan. Um, you know, quite a lot of Nogar arms, those kind of things, you find that when you're using them, at a certain point, they just give way and they start wobbling all over the place. But with this arm yesterday, we've got two anti-twist points. So we've got a, a 3 8 uh, 16th bolt on the front and then a quarter 20 bolt on here. And, you know, when, when this is screwed down, this Titan arm yeah. does not move. So much so <laughs> that if you've got it taken off the camera, and I don't know if we've got another one here somewhere. Uh, uh, I think it's in one. this bag over is here, it? actually. Uh, there we go. If I get this there out. There we go. <laughs> so much so that when it's actually locked down, like, I, I, I think it's called, like, the sleep mode or something. Yeah. That basically you have to, like force it open to then be able to then start using it again. So this is a really solid arm from Bright Tangerine. Um, there's some ultralight arms that are really good as well with, yeah. the, uh, with the ball joints that get a load of really nice tension on them. Uh, but yeah, this and then a, a, something like an ultralight arm have been some of the favorite arms that I've used, especially when you're putting a monitor on there. Yeah, I agree. A buddy saved me from looking like a total idiot with these because I got one and I'm like, Mine's defective, it won't even open up, man. I can't get this thing to undo. And he's like, nah, you just gotta actually use your muscles for it. <laughs> and, I got, and I opened it up and man, the thing's never never failed me since. It's like once you understand, like, okay, it is a little sticky in that sleep mode to get it opened up, get it where you want it positioned, lock it down, the thing does not move. It's absolutely rock. I mean, solid. one of the sick things as well is that these are actually like hot swap removable. So one of the things that is usually quite annoying is, oh, I've got to unscrew it. So potentially what you could do is maybe, hey, I want to have an EVF with a bolt on there. And now this is now going to go over to my AEC, who's got a Titan arm over on this side. And I can move it over and really quickly just bolt it onto this. Um, yeah. So, yeah, super cool. Um, and, I, I, and I saw a comment there saying that the Titan arm got discontinued. And that's why we've got a couple of them here, because they are so awesome. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's just bolt that back on there. Well, and you brought up a great point there, Johnny, on monitoring. Let's not forget, and this kind of leads into this next question here, and I know Clay's going to take this because it's about gimbals, but remember, these Raptors have dual 12G SDI out. So if you don't want to grow the upper architecture with that RMI module, that's why you have that I.O. or those SDIs facing in the back rear of the camera where everyone wants it to be, and you don't necessarily have to grow that architecture. Play something similar to that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what I would say is that on both Movi Pro and Ronin 2, it fits. So it being tall, sure, yeah, it's kind of tall for the cage in there, but as long as it fits and I've got secure mounting points, it doesn't really bother me. I would say if you're trying to really minimize or use a smaller gimbal, that's one of the great things about red control, right? So now maybe the solution is you put your SDI monitor, you get a little phone mount right next to it. Now you've got essentially the same functionality of being able to touch and control your settings while looking at a nice playback monitor simultaneously. I would say that there are huge values to the RMI, in my opinion. I mean, one, one like, of the things there that I've seen people saying they want to do it through the monitor is with the Teradex. So with a small HD and the Cine 7, you can have a built-in receiver into a Cine 7. So you can have that away with an AC. And then you can also buy a module for the Teradex. I think it's called the camera control module. And with the newer Bolt transmitters, you bolt that on the bottom and it's then able to communicate that camera control. A control port then goes into the camera side and then it will then transmit video and also that camera control wirelessly. So again, DSMC3 yeah. monitor is great because you've got a lot of the red specific control functions in there for yeah. autofocus, those kind of things. But if you just want to be able just to do ISO, frame rates, those kind of things, having that set up is probably the way you want to go. And it's flexible if you go to a Komodo or a different camera or these kind of things where the RMI is specific for the V-Raptor on Komodo, it won't work. That is a system where you can integrate that very nicely amongst other camera systems as well. I can hear happy ACs already. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little bit of a lens question here, and I know, Clay, you've been working with the RF lenses as well as myself. Um, care to take this one? Uh, 
Our iPhones that could be coverage. Issue. I know on the 24 yeah. to 70, it does vignette slightightly when yes. you're at 24, and I think on the 16 mil, I'm yes, guessing the, you get the, a little the, bit on the that. The really wide lenses for that large of sensor coverage, you're just going to want to look at the lens's actual focal coverage, right? Like, what image is it throwing off the back, and make sure that that aligns with the dims on the sensor itself. Um, yeah, it, it sounds like you're seeing a little bit of that, that vignetting that does happen, and, that, and that's just based on coverage. There, there's a fantastic tool on CVP's website with their lens coverage. There's also a few apps out there. You can do this camera with this lens, and it'll tell you the image circle. So it might be worth checking that out just to see what the coverage is and at what millimeters. Maybe you drop down to 7K or something like that, or 6K, uh, to kind of get that coverage that you want. Because obviously being designed for Canon sensors, they're usually a bit taller, and we go a bit wider with our 17 by 9 sensor. Exactly, so, which so makes I a ton of sense for where you're seeing it, right, on those edges of the outside, as opposed to seeing it in a full circle where you've got the top missing. And I'm using that 24 to 70 right now, and you are seeing that slight discoloration. I actually would suggest stay with 8K full frame, throw a 95% guide in there, and you now are getting all of your wide corners that you want, and you're not having to worry about those slight discolorations in the corners. And the other thing to keep in mind here, watch this with the RF lens here. I know this is supposed to be 2.8 all the way throughout, but watch the histogram here. Uh, this is a Canon lens. It does get darker as it zooms in. That's part of the Canon RF lenses. That's not a red thing. So I uh, just wanted to call that out. I think we had a question there, options for EVFs. So uh, Zakuto is probably been the one that I've seen yeah. everyone going for. I think yeah. you've shot with it a few times. There's sure the have. Zakuto Chameleon Pro. That's very really nice, the Gratical Eye. The EVF that I have rigged down here is a bit more on the pricier side with the Astro design. That's a really nice EVF. That's mainly I've seen rental houses sometimes carrying that one. There's a few other options out there as well from other third parties, but you know, uh, Zakuto has been the one that we've been kind of suggesting uh, kind of through our channels as well. Yeah, it's the one I see most often uh, in my experience. Especially just for the size, that's the thing. Sometimes yeah. <laughs> you just want the one that's as small as possible you can rig on there and flexible again to go to different cameras, go to the Komodo. Maybe, maybe you've got a, a different third party camera for your yeah. B camera. You can move around and be flexible with that as well. Yes. Now, I, I know none of us are going to talk about the next firmware update, but I just wanted to say with everything that it's working now, I would give it a go and, and stay tuned because there will be some more firmware updates. But even just showing you what I'm doing here, an RF lens with a little red control app, notice I'm actually controlling focus, moving that box around, and you're seeing that there in real time. So being able to control that RF lens, have multiple rack points, and doing that in pretty quickly here. And once again, this is before the update, and it's still in beta. Yeah, I love that. I've actually been even experimenting pretty pretty deep in this. I put uh, put my RF lens on on the gimbal with the RMI and the touchscreen with no focus motor on the gimbal, which is I felt insane. <laughs> I was like, what do I do? But honestly, I was operating with ready rig and I was able to just hold the camera steady with one hand, touch where I wanted to be in focus, and I got some actually surprisingly great results. I was like, okay. All right, this might be a little bit better than me in certain circumstances, which I'm like happy to have. <laughs> and I actually really like when I get out in the water with that water housing, I need to go between my autofocus modes. So if I hit down, down, or actually only down once, notice you're right here and you can change your start autofocus. I can change my size, I can change whether it's continuous or single. And this is all right here on that side panel. And all you'd have to do is tell your AC to hit down once and they get all that autofocus control right there. I think we're getting close to a good time there. So feel free to fire in the last few questions, I think, answer yeah. a few more if there's any more. Um, I, I think we got all the rest of them. I, I'm seeing some more. Uh, thank you for Scott and for everyone else that are putting some good information in here. Yeah. Yeah, Scott's actually got a great video on the chameleon. If, yeah. if you want to get an overview of looking at a chameleon, there's a good video on that. Yeah, I actually I enjoyed that one myself. <laughs> All right, guys. I, I'm seeing more Barney comments. Everyone's looking excited and wants to get the camera in hand. So if, if we're good, I think we'll just go ahead and wrap it up. Oh, great point by Scott. You can customize those menus. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, is when you switch over to and of course, this is the perfect time. My camera just died, so I can't and show it to you. Let me boot up our one and we can see if we can do it. But yeah, but, but basically, 
you've got three customizable pages, as Scott was saying there. So you can hold down on any of those customizable pages and assign basically whatever you want. So peaking, false color, autofocus, um, a preset, whatever you want, be able to toggle between those very nicely. Just while this camera boots up, we can we can give you a quick look at that. And that tools when you're on the when you're on the actual focus knob tab, that's the one with the little white circle on it. You can actually hit the little t additional tools there, and it allows you to pick rack speed, rack um, rack acceleration, um, how many turns of the wheel, and it actually gives you eight more buttons at the top of the screen. So it's a great way to just turn on that lens data tools, and that's where you could go from maybe a wider box to a more narrow box if you're doing a portrait shoot or a car shoot. Or something can you very just turn small. on our, yeah, our James, top can we get our James? overhead? Yep, you got it. Thank you kindly. So wait for that to go full size, and let's see if see if we can get an angle that's there viewable here. So obviously uh, n not designed for a close-up LCD shot here, but uh, if we just come up, you can see we, we, we've basically got a user page. And yesterday, actually, I, I was using this uh, for for our peaking tools. So you can toggle it on. And, and what I'll show here, I know it's not quite the ideal angle, but if you hold down on one of the buttons. You've then got a whole list of, you know, zebra guides, SDI tools, virus open close, um, sensor sync shift. If you're doing virtual production, you need to go up by tiny, tiny fractions uh, to sync to that frame. Uh, and, and then if you have any presets, I don't know if this camera's got any presets on it. Uh, no presets, yeah, but if you had yeah. presets, it would then you can toggle between all those presets very, very easily. And, and you have three full user pages there. So if you notice right out of box, you only have one, it does default to um, the other two pages not being fully on. And once my camera boots up right here, um, I did take the time to make one of those pages just be resolutions and frame rates. And the next one could be looks, and the third one can be for your DIT. And just, uh, I'm still not quite up yet. All right. I think we had and one question while that's just booting up, James, about the locking ring for lenses so obviously as we've got a rf mount camera you know you've got a really wide versatility of lens options you can use you can use rf pl ef lpl uh, m mount any of those and you know as we've got a big old primester lens on here you know you're going to need some lens support if, if you've got a really long heavy lens on there basically if it's got a lens support shoe on it you should probably be supporting the lens but additionally, if you want to provide some additional support, a lot of people, you know, Ignite Digi, Bright Tangerine, uh, make these uh, support adapters that depending on the PL mount or whatever mount you have, because the Raptor's got a load of quarter 20s on the, on, on the top uh, and, and the front of the camera, you can bolt directly into those and it gives you a really rigid mounting system. And additionally, even with that locking ring, it just really makes it a really solid and tight mount to the camera. Um, one of the things to, you know, different mounts have different tolerances depending on what you're putting it on. So you don't always have to force the locking ring to its kind of what, like 10 o'clock yeah. kind of position. The uh, mount that Clay's got on here, because of the tolerances and how that mount's designed, it kind of only really goes around to about like nine or yeah. kind of just, just past their o'clock and that's where it's really solid. So you haven't got to force the locking ring beyond where it kind of sits nice and kind of finger tight is kind of what you would kind yeah. of think of it that, as. That's the thing I was going to mainly bring up is talking to everybody on the engineering team and, and talking about how these mounts work. I, I was pressing too hard, right? I think that's something that, that we want to make sure people understand is you don't have to push it to a specific position, right? You're just going until you feel tension on what you're mounting in that lens mount. And if you're pushing further, pushing further, anything over time is going to start to give as you over crank it. That's why finger tight's really the methodology you should be thinking about here. Right. And you can see that right there. And, yeah, so and, exactly. Yeah. So on, yeah. on those RF lenses, they will kind of lock the whole way. Exactly. Some PL will do it a bit differently. Or there's the kipper tie mounts, which don't even mount to the RF and they just mount to the very front of the body. So the strata, uh, yeah. I, I've, I've got the clear strata, there's an ND strata coming soon, but they just bolt to the quarter 20s and don't even sit on the RF mount. So again, different options depending on yep. how heavy of a lens you're putting on there. If you're putting some heavy cooks, a big primester on there, a mount like that might be more suitable than one that doesn't even have a support option. So check what support yep. options there are available for a mount that you want to choose. And, and kind of like Tim's suggesting right here, I could be miles or feet away from my camera and I can say, hey, just go over hit up once, you're gonna see all my presets here. And with one button here, I can go to 48 frames per second or 8K 120 or 4K 300. 
and then go back to 8K24, and that's very responsive. Notice I also right. have my looks right here as well on the second page. If you go up twice, now you're going to have all my looks. And now I'm going to go ahead and have that black and white LUT applied. And I can very easily just go back to my 8K24. Look at that. Pretty responsive. And your director can call that out in pretty much real time. I just saw a comment there as well. So it depends on the mount. It depends on the mount and the lens. Yep. You know, the, uh, the uh, weight as well. So there, yeah. there are some lenses that are very long, but very, very light. Uh, there are some lenses that are very, very short and very, very heavy, you know, thinking like uh, Tokinas and Cooks. Yeah. They're, they're, they're very, very dense in a kind of short weight uh, kind of distribution, I guess. So those lenses, you want to make sure you've got mount support or some additional lens support. Again, if there's a support shoe on it, you should probably be using it because the manufacturer right. is going, hey, it's a heavy <laughs> lens, probably a good kind of best practice. Totally agree. <laughs> All right, guys. Should we wrap this one yeah, up? Yeah, I, I mean, that's an hour. We, I feel like we did pretty oh, yeah, good. We, we, we rambled on there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. This was a great episode. We hope we answered your questions effectively. Feel free to hit the solid uh, email or the red tone to give us any questions or any comments. And we, we love hanging out with you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.